now you've you've got me interested. Like, I mean, we're talking millions of dollars. It's it's crazy amounts of, of money, especially for some people, perhaps in different parts of the world. I mean, they could submit one of these and then retire. Um, how do we how do we start? I mean, I th in in this gray hat hat gray hat hacking book, as an example, that the, the, I don't know I don't know which section you wrote. So you perhaps you can tell us about that. But like you talk about like programming languages like Python and C assembly. Is there like if I want to get into this world, it sounds really exciting. Have you got some like a roadmap? I kind of asked you earlier, but perhaps we, you can give us some like kind of guidance of what things I need to study or where I need to go to, you know, try and become like you. I mean, I guess first first on the book, uh, I will say something kind of funny, but uh, writing a book is hard. It's yeah. time consuming and it's not very rewarding from the financial side. Typically it's not. It's very rewarding on the branding side and contributing to the community and, and getting your name out there and such. One trick I will tell you, I was very happy when approached by the original authors of Grey Hat Hacking. I'm on the fourth, fifth, and sixth edition that came out in 2022. The first, second, and third, I was not on. And what happened is some authors said, hey, we can't be involved in it anymore. We need another author. And I was lucky or fortunate enough to be asked and trusted. And it's a great opportunity when you can co-author a book with a few other people because it's not nearly as big of a time investment, but you still get to benefit in the the branding and such. So yeah. just, just a thought, but certainly, you know, write, write a book by yourself if you have the time and the passion to do so. Just know what you're getting into. I've I've been asked multiple times to write books, and it's like, no, I'd rather create YouTube videos. Yeah, exactly. Books are hard. Books, books are hard. hard. Go on, sorry. I guess on the getting started side, I said a little bit earlier, it's you still want to start from zero. I, I make another analogy, which is if you're going to learn mathematics, you're not going to start with calculus. If you don't even know basic addition and subtraction and, and algebra, you want to start with the basics and work your way up. Even if, because I, I get some people to come into a class if I'm teaching one and they say, why aren't we starting right away with Windows 11 with every exploit mitigation enabled? And that's pretty much my answer. It's like, do you know how this works and that works? And have you done this before? Yeah. And if they're saying no, we can't just jump right into that. You need to understand the basics. So when I teach exploit development, I always start with a very basic buffer overflow on the stack with no mitigations so that you can see what it used to look like or what it looks like without any mitigations and then start turning one mitigation on at the time. So let's turn on randomization. How does it change the attack? It breaks obviously, so what do we need to do to fix it? It's not always gonna be possible to fix it, so let's understand when it is possible. And then let's add on another mitigation like data execution prevention. I say like treat it like a video game where I used to play games like Halo and Skyrim and once my wife and I had our daughter, I had to give up something <laughs> to have time. And I was like, I gotta give up the gaming because I've got to stay on top of the exploitation stuff on computers. If you take something like Exploit Guard, which replaced the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit on Windows, Exploit Guard is kind of like the, um, the flagship or custom, no, I shouldn't say custom, cutting edge mitigations that aren't turned on by default. Microsoft's in a situation where if they go and turn on all the mitigations that they have, it's gonna break a lot of applications because a lot of applications have dependencies on third-party DLLs or may not be written the same way Microsoft writes things. And so they don't wanna break things, but they're there for you if you're an administrator and you know how to test those mitigations to make sure they're not gonna negatively impact production. That's awesome. Most admins don't know how to do that or don't take the time to do that because they're busy. But if you yeah. do, you can significantly cut down on if there is a zero day, will it be able to exploit your system or not? What I was saying is if you get a working exploit on like a modern Windows system or Linux or Apple, then you can start turning on those mitigations one at a time and treat it like a video game where it's like level one, level two, level three, level four. As you turn on each one, you learn a ton by doing that and you get to a point where you probably are way beyond what you actually need to be able to do because most people don't turn on the mitigations. So I would say to, to like get started, a lot of operating system vendors, like even Microsoft, I remember, I think it was Mark Rosinovich at Microsoft said recently, if you're gonna start a new big project that needs the power of a low level language like C or C++, use Rust because Rust is a lot safer from a memory management perspective. You shouldn't go and start using C and C++ because there are some inherent problems with those languages and you really need to be safe and understand 
the power that you have can result in pretty significant security issues if you don't wield them uh, that properly. So I would say like, pick up a C book, pick up like an introduction to C, introduction to C++, write hello world. I mean, to write hello world in Python, you know, super easy, right? Print yeah, hello too, world. Yeah, too easy, yeah. And, and in, in C, it's even easy, print F. But is there a safer alternative than print F now? Yes, there is. So like, figure out what the, the but if you want to look at vulnerabilities, use the unsafe versions of functions and write a little hello world program, compile it, and then open it up in Ghidra or Ida Pro or Hopper or some other disassembler to see what a basic program like that looks like at the assembly level and, and then go in and create a function call. So now your C program in the main function, it doesn't just call printf and say hello world. The main function actually calls another function where you can pass a string argument to it and that function will now print out what you want it to print. And then you compile it, disassemble it in Ghidra or whatever, and then you get to see the delta, what what the difference is now that your program is a little bit more complex and spending a lot of time like learning how to write a driver, a really basic driver on Windows or reverse engineering and going and playing capture the flags and trying those little crack me programs where you're doing reverse engineering. Anything like that is uh, going to give you a great kind of head start, especially if your goal is to go and sit a course or if, even if you're doing self-study and you're trying to go further and further along. There's a great uh, group of people out there called known by Shellfish. Shell is in like seashell and fish is in phishing scam, yeah. Shellfish. And they've got this how to heap section on the website. And it's all of these heap overflows, like heap exploit techniques going way back to the late 90s all the way up to today. So it gives you a good starting point, like getting an old version of a Linux operating system and trying out the old heap exploit technique and working your way up. So I guess my point is start from the beginning and work your way up and do lots of capture the flags. And some people will say capture the flags are not, they're not worth your time. They're pointless. And I completely disagree with that. Not everybody goes to university and you certainly don't have to go to university, but some people that I know who have gone to schools that are really well known for their computer science and security programs, they've typically taught a theme anyway that I've heard from them is it's not about the classes and the professors being so amazing that you're getting an exponentially greater experience than another school. It's about the people that you meet, their ambition, the, the, the capture the flag groups and the teams that you make. And instead of going out and partying in the evenings and the weekends, these people are studying and hacking. And when one of these individuals comes to a class I'm teaching, I'm like, oh man, this person is well beyond even what we're covering a lot in this class and I gotta step up my game. So you know, associating with smart people and finding what the local uh, capture the flag groups or security groups going to B-sides and all. And I made the example of having to give up something and I said, I'm not gonna give up time with my daughter, so I'm gonna give up video games. I, I'm not, I don't wanna talk about Twitter. I don't personally like social media. And I find that for whatever reason, certain people in the hacking community are quite toxic on Twitter. And yep. so I try to not, I, I, I have made good use of the mute button or mute filter or whatever, mute words. <laughs> exactly. Be because what I'm gonna say is something that I've seen people campaign against. And I'm sorry, I'm for this, which is you gotta give up time somewhere if you want to get really good at this. We don't have the luxury of going back and being a child again and being immersed in Japanese or something if we want to learn that language. If you want to use Japan if you want to learn Japanese today, it's going to take a huge amount of dedication and self-discipline. So to get good at reversing exploit development programming, if you don't already have that experience and even if you do to get better, you've got to give up sleep, uh, going out with that friend on that Friday night, using some of your weekend time. I mean, I remember riding in and out of San Francisco on the BART train, which is our subway, and I crack open a book. I was always, anytime I had a spare moment, because most of us don't have the luxury of working at a company who is gonna pay us to learn all this on the job. To get those cool jobs, you need to know this stuff already. But to know this stuff, someone's had to pay you to do it or take classes or self-study. So you've got to be prepared to really spend a lot of time. It's hard advice, but it's true. I mean, if you really want to get become the best in something, you've got to, there's only 24 hours in a day. What are you doing with your time? Um, I, do, I don't watch television as an example because I just don't have the time.
um, and you like you gave up gaming. You've got to give up something if you want to be really good in in something specific. Yeah, and it's life choices. You've got to decide what's you know what's um, what's right and wrong for you yourself personally. Um, no, no uh, athlete in the Olympics is uh, yeah. is going to yeah. tell you that they didn't sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And you know, and I'm, I'm I'm absolutely not saying give up everything and go twenty four seven hard on this. No, you still need a life. You still need hobbies. You still need friends. That's all very important. I'm just saying. Oh, that one time your friends are going out to the pub, maybe stay home and do some studying. Or oh, I could have done this. And exercise is still important, right? <laughs> you got to decide what's 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 right for you. I think. I mean, if you want to watch if you want to watch TV shows the whole day and sit on the couch, that's your choice. But you know, you're gonna you're not gonna be the same way physically as someone who exercises every day. It's like what what are your what are your life choices? And I mean, if this is really important, I mean, it sounds like the rewards can be very high from a financial point of view as well. Because I mean, those prices that you were showing, um, that that's that's more the the um, how did you say the less reputable example? Is that right? But like reputable is it's still good money, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the prices have gone up. So, like I said earlier, what would have been worth ten to twenty thousand U.S. dollars back in two thousand fourteen, before the mitigations ramped up exponentially, would now be worth potentially a hundred thousand dollars. So you're getting paid a lot more, but it's hard. It's I'm not gonna discount that. It is. It's a lot of work. So, I, I, Ghidra, that's a tool that allows you to do a reverse engineering and deassembly. Is that right? Yeah, Ghidra was released by the NSA a couple of years ago at RSA conference, and it's a free disassembler, and it's also got a decompiler in it as well, which is nice. So, I mean, the great thing about it is it's free. The commercial de facto kind of standard is Ida Pro, but Ida Pro is very expensive, but you know, if you ask me if if I have the choice between both and someone b bought me Ida Pro, I'm going to use Ida Pro because it's been around a lot longer. It's a commercial application, so it's got a lot more dev resources and community support over the years. So, I mean, is, oh, the reason I'm asking this, is there a huge financial um, cost to, to doing what you do? Or is it like is there a lot of free tools out there? Oh, you can, you can do everything completely free. I, I don't see many instances where you have to spend a whole lot of money because all the tools that you need, they're they're all free. Like WinDebug, for example, and GDB. And people have written brilliant extensions like Jeff and PETA and such on, on GDB that you can use to help with exploitation. So yeah, I can't think of any, a whole lot of costs aside from like your hardware you need. And I mean, hardware, it, it just depends which operating system you're going after, right? Like, is it Android or is it iOS or is it Windows, et cetera? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend if you're just getting started in exploit dev to start going after iOS. Um, it's yeah. it's really hard. There are big groups and research teams out there that are year decades ahead and they're they're well funded. They've got a lot of money and um, it's the the ramp up to get to the point where you can be I don't want to say useful but uh, effective or a fit like it's it's long and the techniques yeah. that you tend to hear about publicly are oftentimes outdated by a year or two. And so to get cutting edge, that information is held close to the chest. It's worth a lot of money. So why would people just give that to anyone? Yeah, I would say, you know, starting off on like Linux or the Windows operating system. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there still running Windows 7. I, I think there's, there's still tens of millions of Windows 7 boxes out there. And when you look at Windows 7 against 10 or 11, of course, the mitigations and the security is going to be a lot weaker. Yeah, I mean, so if, if I'm big, if I'm starting, I can start for free and I could use Windows as I'm, I've perhaps got a Windows computer or I can just virtualize and run Windows locally or Linux locally and start learning this, right? Yeah, absolutely. The um, the cost is in like if you want to build a fuzzing farm or something like that at home, obviously you can increase the likelihood that you're going to find a bug if you build a big fuzzing farm in the cloud or with hardware resources at home and the cost can go up at that point but getting started in it and still being effective you don't need much at all 